honestly, for me, the difference between good and great is always discipline. So the question is this, how do most agents find the secrets to succeed in today's competitive real estate market, especially when the top agents are keeping those secrets to themselves? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hi, I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Amuchastegui, and I am back today to interview Jay Pitts. The, I'm really excited to get to hear more about Jay. Jay did a pre-interview with Curtis. And one of the most interesting things that we got to talk about was that his dad was previously interviewed on the podcast. So way back when, I don't know, like a long, long time ago when Pat first started, episode 129, we had Jeff Pitts. And it's, so I think this will be the first time that we've had somebody on here who, uh, who his dad was previously interviewed. So Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. That should be a fun conversation. So tell everybody where, where you live and what life is like out there right now in, in the post-COVID world and real estate, anything. What's it, what's it like out there? Yeah, no, I'm a I'm, uh, broker owner of REMAX Premier Properties in Louisville, Kentucky. So, you know, Midwestern, Southern, I don't know what you call us. I mean, we're, we're kind of gateway to the South, if you will. Um, robust market. We're in the Louisville, the largest city in Kentucky uh, by far. Um, so Louisville is a market that, you know, is a little bit rural, a little bit suburban, a little bit urban. We kind of get, you know, a lot of diversity there. Uh, but r- extremely short on inventory, busy, busy, busy. You know, it's, um, it's, been, a, it's been a great year. COVID, COVID slowed us down uh, as it did everyone. Um, but the market came roaring back just, you know, rates and being short of inventory already with strong demand. Um, I I just, I think for those of us in the market that are really looking for growth, it was a supercharger. I mean, we, you know, um, obviously want everybody to be safe, safe and healthy, but if you're, if you're willing to get out and work, there's plenty of work. Yeah. Does everyone say Louisville wrong that isn't from there? Yeah. So <laughs> um, there's actually a shirt, like the city tourism department sells a shirt with all the different pronunciations listed yeah. one over time. So it, it's actually Louisville. So like- well, I said L- it wrong even trying to say it right. So it's L-U-H-L, Vol, V-U-H-L. Lul. Lul. Ville. But it's spelled with like, it's not spelled like that, right? It's like so spelled, everyone says Louisville on accident, right? Some people say Louisville. Some people say Louisville because it's after King Louis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's Louisville. That's that's funny. As you were, <laughs> um, you know, Jordan, who we had previously interviewed on the podcast when he talked about investing out there, he had said it a bunch of times. And so I, and that actually, if I hadn't had been talking to him, I probably would have been way off on pronunciations. And as you said that, it reminded me like, oh yeah, I bet, I bet people really get this wrong all the time. It's, it's a thing. It's very, yeah. very much a thing. Definitely a thing. So how big is your, how big is so it right now? We're going to get into how you got into real estate and kind of how you started in those first few years. But before we get there, how big is your business now with, you know, agents and volume and stuff like that? Well, it's, you know, it's grown substantially, you know, that's, that's another COVID change that we've seen. We've seen an influx, a large influx of people moving from larger cities and that, that has manifested with clients, but also agents. And then we've had certain industries, service sector, specifically hospitality, um, specifically that have been really hurt by COVID. And those are people that traditionally have skills that apply very well to real estate. So, You've seen a lot of people that have had that maybe back burner kind of thought like, oh, you know, maybe one day I'll try real estate that have gotten a jump start, that have gotten a push. And so our team has grown substantially. We're at 32 agents now on the team. Uh, my brokerage is about 80 agents. So I'm the principal broker, but also a team lead. Um so team makes up just less than 50% of the brokerage. The brokerage has doubled every year for three years and in, in agent count. Um, 
you know, 250 million in sales last year, looking for more like 300 this year. Um, you know, it's business is good. Business is good. What What's the average sales price of a house out there? 200,000. 200,000. The, um, and so the, all those, the service industry people, we've talked about it a lot, you know, since March, like there is the service industry has got hit really, really hard. And there is some amazing talent of people who have worked in the service industry and are unfairly out of work right now or really yeah. struggling when these people have really built a career around customer service and management and sales. And we've kind of told people like, Hey, if you can get those guys working in your business, like they would be great to get great talent. Yeah. Did you intentionally go after and find those people or have you just seen a trend of they started looking for real estate and you were the, you were the shop in town they wanted to go to? You know, I, I didn't. Um, one thing I, I can say, we amazing company culture, which anybody you talk to will tell you that, but like just really, really awesome team, right? It, it people, our, our, our group, like they, they hang out, like they don't just do real estate together. They like hang out. They really enjoy each other's company. I think that's infectious. And so when it, it's all been by referral, frankly, and most of it inbound. And I mean, we do some things, we do a podcast, we do other media, we do a lot of advertising, obviously, for our listings. We, we were very progressive in our use of video and things like that to, to sell the culture piece to the whoever's paying attention. Um, and I think what that did was that positioned us well to be the recipient of inbound, um, really solid talent, just reaching out to us. I mean, I, I've, I've got two, I can recall two, two actors from New York city that decided to move back to Kentucky that just said, you know, the pandemic, we, we were probably on the way out anyway, this whole thing, it's time to go home. They moved back. They're phenomenal agents already inside a year in the business and just absolutely killing it. You know, people like that um, had, had another real estate agent from Brooklyn that moved back home um, has been a real estate agent in Brooklyn for three years, just absolutely destroying business here. Um, we, we've always, we've always taught that there is no bad way to generate a lead. My coach, uh, Mr. Tom Ferry is a mentor of mine. He, he says there's no bad way to generate a lead. So Tom, you know, I, I prescribe to that, whether it be online, whether it be sphere of influence, whether it be cl client events, any sort of lead generation works if you work it. And so um, these people that have been service sector, you know, driven in, in their other careers, they understand that. They understand it. And so, so we've got opportunities. I've got a big enough business and enough listings and enough marketing that generates opportunities. All I need is great talent to foster those opportunities. And so we found a lot, we found a lot of that this year. Yeah. So what are most of your, do you guys do mostly listings, mostly on the buy side or because the office is so big, it just split down the middle? We're about 60, 40, um, 60, 40 on the buy side. And I think that 60 on the buy side, 40 on the list side. I think a healthy business is 50, 50, right? Um, you know, seller's market, obviously you'd rather have listings, buyer's market, you'd obviously rather have buyers, but a healthy business has a fairly equal distribution of both. I think the 60, 40 split in favor of buyers is reflective of the fact that we're relatively youthful and we're not 30 year veterans. Um, I'm one of the oldest agents in our brokerage at 39, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And so these are, these are by and large young people growing careers. They're not fostering a book of business that they've had for 25 years. And I think that tends to lean a little more toward the buying side. And that's why I think you see the 60, 40 split. Yeah. I think you're totally right. I think when, I think when agents are younger, their sphere of influence hasn't bought their first house yet. Yeah. Right. So, so it does make the fact that you guys, that you, that your demographic of people in your office are so much younger that you're so close to it, like 60, 40 is pretty darn close to a 50, 50. Yeah. So that's, that feels like a pretty healthy business. So what about, so when did you get into real estate? Um, it, you know, it's funny. You mentioned my dad earlier. I mean, you could, I guess, technically say my Forever. whole life. <laughs> yeah. Forever. Uh, I got licensed in 04, like two weeks after I graduated college. Um, but I went to work in the mortgage business first because I was a, I'm a stubborn firstborn and I didn't want to follow in dad's footsteps, or at least that's what I thought then. 
So I, I did something different, but similar is kind of what my idea was. And I had some good success at that, but I, I wasn't incredibly passionate about it. But I was licensed the whole time. I was investing. I was representing friends and uh, flipping houses and buying rental property and that kind of thing while I was in the mortgage business. Around the end of 2007, I decided to pivot from there and get into real estate full time. So probably the worst possible time in the history of real estate to get in. Well, I was kind of wondering because even like 2004, I don't know if it was different in Kentucky, but you know, 2004, 2005, I was in Southern California and we're building brand new houses. And man, as soon as we could build them, they were like pre-sold the moment they would come out. We were like golfing a couple times a week. Like life was easy. It was just about like, how fast can we build these things and they're going to sell. And all of a sudden that came crashing down and like 2007, I remember when all of a sudden we were really, really struggling, but like 2004, 2005, that had to be a great time to be a mortgage officer, right? It like, was, the, it was, I mean, I, happening. I was a kid, you know, I mean, I was 21, 22, right out of fresh out of college. So like, yeah, I mean, I was an achiever. I was, I was kind of raised that way. So for me, it was like, I jumped on the treadmill, you know, and pumped it up to 10 miles an hour and just took off running like that. Yeah, those- Commissions as a 21 year old, the, yeah, yeah, I mean, I made more money than all my friends. I, you know, I mean, we, whatever, but it, it, I don't know. I, I, I like the mortgage business. It just wasn't for me forever. Um, and so I pivoted into real estate. (laughs) It was probably really, it was out of the frying pan into the fire because mortgage was starting to crater in 07 when I got out and about the only industry that was worse was real estate. And I got into from one into the other. So. I talk about 2005 for me was just a really un, unfair expectation of what life was supposed to be like. Cause I got my college degree and then we started right out of college getting paid six figures to, you know, yeah. run this, this office and golf in a couple of days a week. And then the crash happened and we went from like oh, yeah. being paid way more than we were worth to being like, how are we going to pay rent and how are we yeah. going to do anything? Like it was so 2007, the, the market was kind of, peaked out and foreclosures and short sales and things like that had kind of started right at real, right around then yeah. 2007, 2008. So what did you do when, so you said like, Hey, I'm going to be an agent now. How, what was that like? How did it go? What was 2007, 2008 like for you? Well, it, I got, I got off to a very fast start. Um, but there was a lot of worry in the early going. I, I, so I came from the mortgage business. I had a property management background. Um, you know, knew some people that I at least knew who to prospect. And I ultimately I got into the REO listing game, um, was fortunate. I kind of got in right before they slammed the door shut. But, you know, I remember those first couple of months of, you know, right around this time of year in 2008, I was just prospecting, just prospecting like crazy. And I, I did about five or six deals in my first, I think it was six, six transactions in my first two months. They were all investor buy sides. I think they averaged about 50,000 a piece. So I I ran my legs off and still didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, I can't do this forever. I got to get some listings. So I went out, took five listings, which if you're trying to get listings in 2008, they were easy to find because nobody could sell anything. Right. And and they're like, go ahead and try. Like, go go ahead, put a sign out there. Yeah. So I took five listings. I didn't get a single showing on any of the five listings in the first two months. So 60 days, I had five angry sellers and I was like, what have I done? I've made a bad mistake. And that's when I started doing BPOs. You probably remember those. I used to do broker price opinions for pay. I found a couple of companies. They paid $40 a piece. It's about three hours worth of work a piece. And so I was making like $13 an hour to do real estate. Um, But I just took as many orders as they would give me. And I was doing like 20 a week. You know, I just gotten married. My wife and I owned a house. We had car payments and student loans and I just had to do something. Right. And I was a mover. Right. I never, never sat still. So I didn't know how. And that was something I could do. And I I ration rationalized that if the REOs are the only thing that's selling, well, I have to find a way to get those listings. And if these people are asking me to do a broker price opinion on them, that means that they know something. They know something about the listing side. In some cases, the, the people doing the BPO, given the BPO orders, were actually the ones 
who had the ability to give you the listing. And a lot of times it was a contractor, but either way, I made it a point to not let these people, I get them on the phone, number one, the internet was different then, right? Not as helpful as it is today. It was still very much a thing, but yeah. not as helpful. Business wasn't being done the same way as it is today. So you could still get somebody on the phone pretty easily. Now, if you don't want to get somebody on the phone, you're not going to get them on the phone. But I would prospect every single order. I'd make it a point to speak to somebody, to ask them questions like, is this report the way you wanted it? Can I fix anything? Is there anything I can do better? And oh, by the way, who, who assigns your listings? I want to talk to them. And I would, I parlayed that into three or four REO listings in about 90 days. Um, and I sold them, but I still didn't make any money. And then I got a break, which is my old, I was a, I was a loan originator, believe it or not, at Countrywide Home Loans before they went out of business. Mm -hmm. And my old regional manager um, called me up one day and said, I think we're going to be losing an REO agent because Countrywide was a big servicer. So they had, they had a lot of REOs to disposition. And I said, I, who do I talk to? Let me, let me interview. Let's do it. And I just slayed the interview. And uh, even though I'd only been in the business for three or four months, they hired me to list their REOs and they, day one, they gave me 15 listings. Yeah. And then about 30 days later, they picked up the VA contract from Aquin and I got another 15 in a day. So in like 60 days time, I went from no listings to 30 listings. And I ended up that finishing that first year with 50 sales. And then the next That's year, yeah, it was crazy. And the next year I did 160. That is wild. Like the, um, for people that weren't around in real estate back then, I mean, BPO is a word that people use, still use a lot, right? Like that's now a, a technique to get a listing, right? It's like telling yep. somebody, this is how much your house is worth. Yep. Or it's a way to get a lead. Like people are putting on Facebook, like, hey, if you have any interest in selling your house, you know, I'll give you a free broker price, 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 price opinion. But I remember back then people were figuring out the REO space. Lenders were figuring it out. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody was really ready yet. Like foreclosures had happened, but nothing like that. And so as they were coming up with those systems, I know a lot of agents that yes, were doing BPOs to get paid 13 bucks an hour because there was no other business. There's no work. <laughs> Real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Amuchastegui with a quick commercial break from our sponsor, Rent Ready. Why do you invest in real estate? To retire early? To build your dream home? Start your own business? Whatever the reason, whatever the dream, Rent Ready can help you reach it. With Rent Ready's unlimited property management features, your real estate dreams are also unlimited. Rent Ready is landlord tenant software that covers all of your real estate investing needs, including unlimited properties, tenants, and live customer support so you can start small and grow your business without increasing costs. You know, I've had plenty of subscriptions before where you get charged like per house that you own or per deal you've done. And what they're saying is, hey, it's gonna cost the same thing no matter what. Whether you have one house, 10 house, or 100 houses, they're not gonna penalize you when you grow and they're gonna help you grow. Rent Ready is a flat price and scalable for your needs. No need to shell out big bucks for multiple management softwares. With Rent Ready, they have everything you need all in one platform so you manage your rentals and grow your portfolio. As a special offer, you've heard it on here before, you can try Rent Ready for one year for only a buck, but with, you have to use our code. Here is the code ROCKSTAR, R-O-C-K-S-T-A-R, and sign up for Rent Ready's annual plan at rentready.com. That's R-E-N-T, R-E-D-I.com with code ROCKSTAR to get rent ready for a year for just a buck. And if you want to learn more about rent ready or you want to learn more about Ryan, the CEO and founder of rent ready, go check out episode 939 where I interviewed him about why he created this, this platform and what they're doing next. The shift that you talked about there that I think that there's probably going to be some sort of opportunity like that for agents out there over this next year. And I don't quite know what it is. And when, when agents have the opportunity, you might not know what it is. They, they might not realize what it is yet. But you said, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to do the minimum here, like I'm going to see what this might lead to. Yeah. Kind of like doing a favor for somebody and then later it pays off. But you went in with the intention and said, all right, I, I know I'm only getting paid 13 bucks an hour for this, but hopefully it's my way in. I'm not going to half-ass it. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to follow up with them. I'm going to keep pointing that in there. And maybe none of them assigned you that big thing. But then when the countrywide thing broke open and some people listening to this are going to be like, that dude's super lucky on day 90. I was lucky. 15 listings, and you were lucky. But I think something that probably helped you crush that interview is you got to say, I've done 90 BPOs. 
or however many you yeah. had done, right? And by doing that practice, someone was also paying you to practice. So whereas right now you could be you know, getting paid to do BPOs and you could look at it as I'm only getting paid 13 bucks an hour. The other idea is getting, hey, you're getting paid to learn, getting paid to educate, and it got you ready for that other interview yeah. that turned into, and selling REOs back then was way different. So somebody trying to put their house on the market, the first five listings you had, those didn't sell because people needed to sell it for 200 when they're, when they're, you know, it was worth 150. Their loan was 200 and it was sure. worth 150. You get the REOs and those, those banks are like, we will accept the best offer regardless of what it is. Right. And people. I mean, that's ex that's exactly right. I mean, people wanting to sell and being able to sell financially capable of selling are two different things. The banks were, you know, I mean, we backstopped them with our tax dollars so that they could liquidate that inventory and not crater, you know, our economy forever. That was an unfortunate occurrence. But to me, I saw a market shift that was going to require a service similar to the one I provided. And all I had to do was align myself with that interest. Yeah. You know, another thing that you mentioned that really resonates with me is something I say all the time to our agents is you first have to be inspired before you can be inspirational. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I knew, and I've had several other situations similar in my career, some recent and, and really throughout my career where I've had the opportunity to really make an impression on someone. And I always take that super serious. Like, you know, um, I obviously had to pivot away from the REO at some point because the business just dried up. Mm -hmm. And so those opportunities for me have, have not been in short supply over time, but every time I identify one of those opportunities, I just really, really put my best foot forward, you know, because if they think, I, I mean, that's what God, I didn't, I had no business getting that contract, no business. I was six months in the business. I had no money. They were asking me to front all this cost for them. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Like but utilities I knew I gonna, and stuff like that. Cause back then they were like, but you're going to put asked, utilities on your own credit card. We'll reimburse you if you sell it type thing. That's it. I mean, and, and there, there's a, there's a really good story. If you want to get into that, I can get, there's a really good story about the, about the expenses that came later in that first year. But I just, I had to, I think what I did was I inspired the gentleman that hired me. Mm -hmm. He knew how much it meant to me and how hard I was going to work for it. And that's why he hired me. Cause I had no business getting that contract otherwise. So that was like 2008, mm -hmm. right? And then so by 2010, 2011, there's still foreclosures, but most of them are now selling on the courthouse steps instead, because now there's like a new range of investors. So they're buying them before they became REO. Were you still getting REO leads in 2010 and 2011? Or when did it dry yeah. up? And what did you transition? When, how did you transition to something else? What, what was dried up? And, yeah, dried up in 13. Okay. It kind of ran pretty decent in 13. It was at least probably 50% of our business through 13. Um, and I pivoted to team building, which I had built a team because of the REO business. I remember the first agent I ever hired going to lunch with him at his he, he worked at a, he worked at a Chase bank and um, he was a personal banker and it was at the hospital, you know, those bank branches in the hospital and they have like yeah. the hospital cafeteria Well, he, he couldn't, he was in a park, parked in a parking garage, getting out was a big deal. It's like, I'll come to you. And I remember sitting down with him in the hospital cafeteria saying, dude, I need you to come work for me because I've got all these leads and just like, like scanning text messages because I had the 1-800 IVR, like ProQuest technologies, like text pinging my phone all day. Because that's the thing. REOs were in vogue. Every investor wanted access to them. And I'm running probably 10x the effort of a normal listing to keep one REO on the market. And I've got 100 of them, yeah. right? Um, in very short order. So I had no time for buyer leads. And I think a lot of REO agents made the mistake of not capitalizing on the proximity to all that other business. Um, I, I never made that mistake. I started building a team immediately when I saw that amount of li buyer lead inventory that I could get my hands on as a result. And so, and that kind of is the way it went until about 2013 when the market had pretty much taken a, a turn for the better. The REO started slowing down and I, I then had to pivot to a more traditional lead generation kind of method, but I built up a pretty good sales force. And then that ran till about 2016 when I launched my brokerage 
most of my team members went out on their own and started their own teams under the brokerage. Mm-hmm. And I started rebuilding the team from scratch at that point. Yeah. Something that you added in there was when you were getting all the listings, it's, it's kind of easy in life when things are going really, really good to ignore the, uh, ignore the others. Right. Yeah. So it's like when people are getting, uh, it's really common for agents to ignore sign calls if they have a listing. Because they're like, you know, the sign call, the chances of this person actually buying a house this weekend or actually buying this one, or if somebody wants to come see my open house without an agent, like, man, do I really want to start over? And especially when people get big into listings, like agents that focus on listings, there's a lot of leads that are given away because they don't want to deal with the sign calls. They don't want to do the, that. So be, when, when times are going good, and like times are going good for you and you could have ignored those other leads and said, I just simply don't need them, right? I'm doing so well with these REO listings. I don't need more people being able to capitalize on that. I think that the, I think that in real estate, it's really easy to go, hey, things are going really, really good. So I don't need to do that right now. I don't need to diversify into investing. I don't need to diversify into other teams. I don't need to try new lead sources, but being able to take when you're getting those wins, but then also say, but how can I diversify? How can I expand? That that has to be a big part of how your why your company is so big now, right? You you took you took everything and you got to leverage it to, to go to the next level. Yeah, I mean there I, there were definitely mistakes made, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, like if we could all, I mean, look, I, I bought, bought a bunch of well, I bought a bunch of houses. I should have invested more. Um, but I mean, you got to give yourself a little bit of grace because how does anyone ever know that they're in a once in a lifetime situation? Yeah. When they're when it's the first time this thing has ever happened. Like I didn't know how fortunate I was. Now, I I, I I like to say it was right time, right place, right time, right skills, because I could have easily blown it. it. It like there were agents lined up to take my position. I earned it, I kept it, right? And I benefited from it. There are things I would do differently. I probably would have leveraged out more of the list side to my team if I had to do it over again. And I definitely would have, that's easy to say, like I've got houses I paid 30 grand for that are worth 150 now. Mm -hmm. And I'm never going to see five X 10 year growth again in my life. I don't think in terms of real estate purchases. I mean, what I should have done is spent every dollar I had buying real rental real estate because those were once in a lifetime lows, but I had no way of knowing that I still bought 25 houses and I'm, really good equity position in those. I wish I would have bought a hundred. Yeah. um, It's impossible to know this. Like you said, when you're in the middle of a once in a lifetime opportunity, being able to take advantage of it, we flipped so many houses from 2009 to 2012 and the, and we were making so much money monthly and I didn't invest in anything. I didn't know any better. I thought it was going to last forever. I didn't have any mentors teaching me about owning real estate long-term, you know, we were buying foreclosures and fixing them and selling them. And then in hindsight, you go like, wow, that was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And the, and I think we, ha- I think we're in one now, right? So yeah. like, obviously the world changed a lot in the last year, figuring out for people listening, like figuring out what your opportunity is or what it is. But this is a, this last year has obviously been a monumental shift in the world. And there are a lot of things yeah. that, you know, that, that even in the first three to six months became a once in a lifetime opportunity and the opportunity has gone. But, you know, for, for some of the investments and things like that out there, but it is so tough to, you know, hindsight is always amazing, right? I'm not, who knows what they'll say hindsight is now. I think people will talk less about hindsight being 2020. 2020. Yeah. But the, uh, but yeah, I mean, we figure out later that the opportunities that we have and um, yeah, it's easy to beat ourselves up about what we would have done different. And you yeah. know, what is one thing that someone would have told you about real estate your first year? Or if you could go back and tell yourself one thing, what advice would you give yourself about, about real estate? Oh, uh, wow. Um, that's a great question. Gosh, there's so much. Um, okay, here it is. This is pretty good. And it took me until 2014 to learn this. Um, it's... It's not how little you spend, it's how much you keep that matters. So you could rephrase that. You could say, you gotta spend money to make money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for, for me, I spent the early part of my career pinching pennies. 
Um, I was incredibly frugal. I was incredibly stressed. I was overworked personally. I put too much on my own shoulders, on my own back. Um, I'm good at that, right? If you go back and listen to that episode with my dad, you'll, you'll hear that in his voice. Like that's what he taught us, he taught us how to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was the answer. You know, nobody can ever take your work ethic away from you. Yeah. Right. You can take everything you have, every monetary possession that you ever accumulate, but they can't take away your will to work. If you have your will to work, you'll always be okay. And that, that's true. Okay. But there is a moment where there's like an inflection point when you've had a little bit of success where if you continue to do the same things that you've always done, you put yourself under a lot of undue stress. And I did that. I did that to myself. I did it to my family. I did it to my kids. I did it to my wife. And I wish I would have been more comfortable allowing others to help me sooner. Yeah. You know, I built a team, but instead of, I mean, th th they picked up everything that went un like went unaccounted for, and I still pressed myself just as hard, if not harder, to do even more myself. So you built a team, but you still like worked as much as you possibly could all yeah. the time. It was kind of like you, the team had to, was going to get the leftovers, for lack of a better word, but you were still going to just crush it. Well, I, I did crush it, and and I can give you numbers. I remember vividly. But what I, what I tried to do was inspire them to build a business for themselves under my umbrella, which is still very in integral to what I do today. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wasn't handing my business off. I was saying, here's leads. Here's how you convert leads, go work. And, but in 2015, we did 360 transactions and I did 150 of them personally. And, and I had six other agents, which if you take the other 210 and divide it by six, that's a pretty high agent productivity rate, right? 35 yeah. transactions or so per agent. Like, but who in their right mind wants to sacrifice what is required to do 150 transactions in one year yourself? I should have never done it. Yeah. Yeah. So. The, uh, it's there. Those are interesting things we, we get to learn in life of, of how much, how much more is worth more or the, uh, yeah. you know, growth, like you grew very quickly and the, and yeah. there aren't very many people that get to teach people how to grow. What about, so I've got kind of some fire round questions that are like some, some okay. uh, just advice stuff. So what, did, what was one thing? And they might be hard. They might be hard for you to think of an example, like the last one, but what was one, what's probably the best thing you learned in 2020? It could be about real estate or life. Like what's the biggest takeaway? Um, good. Great question. Um, resilience, how resilient people are. Um, you know, I'd say resilience is, is it, it it's just, it's something we, we live charmed, which we live most of us a charmed lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, when something happens that threatens to take, now I know it didn't for everyone, for some it did, but when something happens beyond your control that threatens to take it all away, you see, you really get to learn how resilient people are. And, um, but also beyond that, grace is important. You know, if somebody just didn't feel like working in April, I wasn't giving them a hard time about it. You know, yeah. like if, if a client just called me up out of the blue and I've got says, I know we've got an accepted offer on our house, but we're not going to be there at closing. You need, can you help me figure it out? Because we're just, we're done. Well, you know, they, I think deserve some of that grace because nobody had, no, nobody had ever been through what we, what we collectively went through in 2020. So I made so resilience many and grace. In April and May. Like I, I know that <laughs> April and May I made so like I made a lot of good decisions, but there were others that I wish I would have done different. But that was those are very poetic. I love those answers. You know, res, resilience and grace. Like the two, the two keys that if we could take that into our life of of knowing that hey, you're more resilient than you need to be, and most people are more resilient than they need to be. And when people aren't or are struggling with that, then giving them grace because I yeah. saw I met plenty of people that just that thrived through the crazy. And plenty yeah. of people that just that absolutely lost sleep, that absolutely lost yeah. sleep out of um, my wife is very empathetic about the world. And so when I would yeah. be like, when she'd be like, Hey, are you worried about this, this, and this? I'm like, well, this part of our business is struggling, but this part is great. And I'm not worried. We're going to be fine. Don't worry. And she would like, but she would lose sleep, but she's like, but what about everybody else? But yeah. what about everybody else out there? And so the, uh, it's, I think, I think your two ways. So 
How about ways that you your business like survived or thrived in 2020? Was there a pivot or was there something that happened? I mean, the real estate the real estate market just started to you know pick up a lot, like a lot better than we thought it was going to be. But was there something yeah. that you were like, hey, this this is how we survived it? Well, you know, um, I don't know. I think it was just it was it was a magnifier. It was everything we were already doing got a shot in the arm. You know, I mean, we took a pause and then it was time when it was time to go back to work and and not that we stopped working because we weren't a shelter in place. We weren't a complete lockdown kind of community. Um, There were definitely some guidance and some, some, some definite shift in the way we do things, but nobody was ever told you can't work. Real estate was 100% essential the entire time as it pertains to the way our state government looked at things. You know, I've got friends in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania and Michigan and other places that were literally told they cannot work, you know, and that we didn't have to endure that. Um, So, but when it was time for things to become more normal, we were ready. And frankly, I think it, it just took all the good we were doing once that, once we turned that corner, all the good we were doing just really, like I said, was turbocharged. You know, we did pick up some really strategic wins for our business this year. Um, you know, some, some pretty impactful new construction relationships that I think is a big part of our solving our inventory crisis. And I would probably call it a crisis in some markets, ours included. We're, we're below, we're sub one and a half months on supply right now. Um, so we really need the houses. So we picked up some really impactful relationships there. I am an internet lead fan, Zillow. I am not, um, I'm not a Zillow naysayer. So we, we received some, some very good news from Zillow this fall. Um, we were, you know, adopted into, into a serious program they're working that has been a big benefit to our business. So, you know, those are, those are, not, um, it was kind of like that interview situation we talked about before, you know, we had to go out and win those relationships. We had to go out and earn those. And maybe those were opportunities that we wouldn't have had, had 2020 not went the way it went, because I think it moved up timelines for a lot of industry players. Yeah. Um, and they, they went looking for partners and we were the most viable partner for a couple of organizations that are going to make a big impact on our business. It sounds like if I was going to try to summarize that, it was kind of like in 2020, you just stuck to the plan, right? You you, you stuck to the, you you were already doing all these things, but it just amplified it. So you just, you said, Hey, like the world is going crazy, but like the, this, a lot of the things in real estate are the way they are. So stick to the plan and show up and still work really hard. And then, uh, and then you got to see the benefits of that. So what do you think for 2021? If you were going to like, you coach your agents, you give them advice, you have your own podcast. If you're going to say, this is how you're going to succeed in 2021. Is it stick to the plan or is it what any extra advice you give them for 2021? Yeah. Um, so we had our team retreat a couple of weeks ago. Um, so for me, I, you may see this. I talked in the way that I talked about, you know, resilience and grace. For, for me, words are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. The meaning of words are very important. Having, you know, certain, like we have, we have, we have a team, a phrase, we we like to call it right team, right time. Like that, that's reflective to me is that I have the right people in place for the right opportunity to make big things happen. Um, What I told the team though, was the two buzzwords for our retreat this year for 2021 were context um, and discipline. That's it. So context is about knowing what you want, having a clear picture about what you're trying to achieve. And it's different for everybody as a collective. Our team is really looking for a monster year in terms of growth, both in agent count, volume, transaction size, all of it. We were looking for that in 2020. We got it in an unexpected way. So what I basically did was flip it back to where I was in in December, January, 19 to 20, that rollover from 19 to 20 and said, okay, this year should be a little more predictable. Mm -hmm. And if it's a little more predictable than 2020, where is our ceiling? Okay. What do we want? Okay. And 
honestly, for me, the difference between good and great is always discipline. That's how you get from good to great is discipline. We all know the things we should do that we're not. We yeah. all know our individual failings. We can give ourselves grace and still understand where we failed. And all I'm asking for from my team is just an ounce more of discipline. Just an ounce more. That's it. Just move the needle some. That's it. The, the difference between good and great is discipline. That is, uh, that's an incredible quote. The, I, I really, really like that. So you guys, you have a ton of buyers agents, ton of listing agents, the, and, but right now you said 60, 40 buyers, what's your, the, and it's a, a seller's market. So people are replying back and saying, we have 56 offers, like literally like a crazy amount of offers on stuff. What's your number one trick or way to get your offer accepted? If you're a buyer's agent competing with other buyers. No doubt. Um, okay. So this is, this is something I've placed and this is, this comes from my dad too. A lot comes from my dad. Okay. We, we did a podcast episode. I, you, I don't want to curse on your show, but, um, there's the stuff my dad says, like, yeah. did you read that book? And there was a website that, you know, it's not stuff, yeah. but you, you know what I mean? I so it, we yeah. did, we did an episode of my podcast where, my co-host at the time and I just went through quotes, real estate quotes that I learned from my father. Right. And, um, he, you know, he says a lot, but I, I, I've learned an incredible, incredible amount from him. Um, what he taught me was to value agent relationships. He taught me to, 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 speak to those agents the way I spoke to those REO asset managers back in the day, right? The, the inspired versus inspirational kind of idea. What, how you get your offer accepted is to break through and build rapport with the listing agent, period, end of story. There is no post-closing possession or, I mean, look, price is king. We know that, Right. But if you're a financed buyer and it won't appraise for the amount that you have to write your offer for to get it accepted, well, we're, nobody gets anywhere then. So what ends up happening is building the rapport with the listing agent, finding out what ancillary items aside from price are impactful to the seller on this particular listing and doing that, getting your client, helping them understand why it's necessary to make concessions in certain places to make your offer more attractive. And it's different from every seller, you know, that you yeah. run into. So the agent's the only one that's got the key to that. You've got to get it from them. And it's, it's increasingly more difficult because agents are processing 25 offers. Yeah. So how do they have time to talk to 25 agents? They don't. So you got to be creative. You got to have a good rapport built with them already. Um, that there's, there's a way to break through, but the agents that know how to break through, they're the ones that have success in multiple offers. I love that breakthrough with the listing agent, the, and then, because, because you need to figure out exactly what this, you want, you need to figure out what the seller wants, but you can't figure that out unless you get to talk to the listing agent and the exactly. listing agent is not going to talk to you and 25 other people, unless you figure out a way to break through. So listen, if you're a buyer's agent out there, figuring out how to break through with those, we had a, you know, we're buying, trying to buy some investments, house gets listed a week ago. We were at a full price cash offer, 10 day close three hours after the listing comes out. And about two hours later, they say, sorry, your offer wasn't accepted. And we're just like, but why? Just tell us why or counter back or something. It was the most bizarre thing to go like full price cash, 10 day close and just, and just say like, sorry. But the reality yeah. is, is because they had so many and somebody else probably had that relationship and figured out, yeah. you know, so cash 10 day close, wasn't it? Or there was somebody else that had the cash 10 day close that the, that the agent had a relationship with. And they said yeah. like, yeah, these other guys sent an offer and it's the same as this one, but I know these other guys and they'll close it. So like, who do you, you know, so it, it's yeah. a really interesting uh, strategy piece out there. That's been, there's been a lot. Of, I ask everybody that right now is we're putting together some series about some of those questions. And, and it's been the most common is to find out what the seller wants, but you're the first one to say really break through to that, make, get the relationship with the listing agent, figure out and how so, to make that happen. Like that's goal number one. And sometimes it's done before you ever like sometimes the only way to do this is to start well in advance of the moment where you you're presenting that offer 
because yeah. circumstances don't always dictate that opportunity. But like for me, um, I try to leave every interaction I ever have with an agent in a positive way. I want when they see my name on the top of an offer, which I'm not personally writing a whole bunch anymore. Now I want them when they see my team at the top of the, that offer, I want them to think, OK, this is legit because it's got J Pitt's name on it. It's legit. And when 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 the number comes up on their phone, they want to take that call because they want to talk to me or my agent about why it's legit. Yeah. So that's that's you gotta be it. nice to people all the time, right? The, Dude, you, you have, have to. If you're if you're if you're a jerk to somebody now, you never know when they're going to be holding the key to your future success. Yeah. The uh, I've read so many books that that is uh, becomes so part, and we've all had our own stories with it. But yeah, yeah this is the time when you never know when you're going to need somebody's help or on the other side and, and you were a jerk to them or they were a jerk to you before and it changes. How about the, so on the flip side of that, I mean, listing agents right now, list, you know, people can sell their house for kind of as much as they want and they get multiple offers. But if you were going to, you know, meeting with a seller, if it was, there, are there any tricks or strategies you give them and say, Hey, if you do this, this, and this, we're going to be able to sell your house for more. Cause some people more is what they want. Any things out there that you're constantly telling your listing people like, Hey, if you want, if you want to sell it for more, this is the way to do it sellers, um, you know, professional cleaning, impeccable media, uh, professional cleaning is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I, <laughs> you know, people never think their house is dirty. It's a really tough conversation to have. Yep. Um, you know, I have a, a very tactful way to have that conversation. Um, but so I always say that there's three things that sell a home, right? It's price, it's exposure, okay, and appeal, right? Um, and and so we work on the price together, the agent and the seller, right? We determine what the price is together. They obviously want the highest price possible, and we don't want to take it above where we believe we can deliver results. Um, the exposure is is our job solely because you know they don't hire you so that they can go market the house themselves. They that's what they bring you on for. Uh, I, I go well above and beyond any of my competition in terms of exposure, both from a monetary and an effort standpoint, because I want to eliminate that variable from a seller's decision making. I don't want them ever to think that I'm the problem because they hire me as a marketer first and a negotiator second. But that leaves appeal, which is solely in the seller's hands. I can't, I don't live in the house. I can't keep it clean for them. I can't make it smell good. I can only advise them when it doesn't smell good or it doesn't look good. And mm -hmm. so what happens is if I do my job when it comes to exposure and I deliver the showing traffic, but the showing traffic doesn't yield an offer, there's one of two things wrong. Either the ho house didn't measure up to ex expectations or the price is wrong. Those are two variables that are neither one my, within my control. So I always tell sellers, you know, staging is important. Like, you know, appeal is important, but that's, that's your call. Like, I'm going to tell you what I think, but if you don't listen to me, that's on you. Yeah. Um, and it, if you, you'll, you'll be surprised at when you, everybody thinks that they have to tap dance in a listing appointment. If you go in resolute, confident, and you make them assume some responsibility for success, they'll hire you more often than the, the person that comes in and tells them everything they want to hear. Yeah. The, uh, I think that is, that is really, really good advice. You know, I could talk to you for a while about a lot of stuff. You have you have a lot of, of different things with that, but it is that, that's one thing. Like cleaning is so much bang for the buck, right at the very yeah. end. It's like what what gets them into the house? Price and pictures. What gets yep. the deal? You know, quality. And when they get there, so the when they're getting there, it's usually like price is what gets them there. So you're right. If they aren't getting it, it's not living up to expectations. So if there was a trick to sell your house for more, it would be impeccable professional cleaning because yeah. it leaves a better impression. And, and it really is. If you walk into a house and, and, it, and it smells like animals and things like that, there's a different offer that's in somebody's brain. There's a different desirability level. It's really hard for them to forget about the family that used to live there and yeah. picture how they're going to be there when there's anything throwing that off. But the, uh, man, I never know if our podcast are going to go 20 minutes or 45. We're almost at an hour. So the, uh, we have okay. to you know, finish the show because of how much good stuff you had there. But people are going to want to reach out to you. People are going to want sure. to reach out to you and get more advice. I mean, you have your own podcast. I think I want to go listen to your podcast, listen to more of this to see how we can bring 
more people, but um, what's your, what's your podcast? How can people find you? If somebody's looking at getting into real estate in Louisville, if I, I probably got close on saying it, that was right, good. That was good. Know, that was that man. I, I took some notes on how to do that. How should people find you? Where are you at? And, and uh, what's next? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I said, I'm principal broker and owner of Remax Premier Properties. You can find us online and any social channel. Um, my personal handles are at J Pitts Realtor, at J Pitts Realtor, J A Y P I T T S. Uh, the podcast on iTunes is Resource, Real Talk About Real Estate. The R E are in parentheses. RE, but you can just search my name on iTunes and it'll come up really easy that way. That's probably the best way to find me. We're about a hundred episodes in, um, been doing the podcast thing for quite some time, really have a lot of fun with it. It, you know, it ebbs and flows as I'm sure, you know, better than anybody. We go tactical, philosophical, local, national, uh, you know, current evergreen, like it, it, we, we do a lot really, uh, as I'm sure you can tell, I don't have a problem here in my own voice. So uh, I got a lot to say. So I put it out there. Our agents seem to like it. That's really awesome, man. Well, the, I have, I love your story. I love, I love your whole story of, of how it started and and where you've taken it and the, you know, the things you've done right and the things that you would do different all the way along the way. It is not a surprise of how, of how big your business is and how big you've built it. So Jay, thanks for coming on the show. Real Estate Rockstars, thank you guys for listening and go check out some of Jay's other stuff. Until next time, thanks for being here. All right, Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Muchastegui jumping in again to thank you for listening to the show. Hopefully you guys loved listening to that one. And I wanna make sure that you know about all of the extra resources that we have. And also we need your help. They say podcasts are free. You get to listen to podcasts for free. But what is the cost of that podcast? I would say if I could beg you to pay anything for that podcast, I would say the cost of the podcast is going and giving a review. So whether you download it on Google or Apple or YouTube or anywhere else, please go give us a review. Say what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps us get better guests. The more reviews, the higher we get in the rate rankings. Right now, we are the biggest podcast out there for real estate agents. And we want to keep that spot because we know there's lots of podcasts out there. So go give us a review. Also, be sure to go to hybendigital.com. If you liked any of the resources that those real estate agents talked about, we've got a huge video vault of those resources for free. Every punny that comes on the podcast that we interview, they give us something that helps them get their deals or helps them work with their clients. And we put that in the toolbox in our vault for you. So go to hybendigital.com and you can get it. If you're looking for real estate education, go to rebusuniversity.com. We have all sorts of courses in there to help agents succeed in real estate. How to get the listing, how to negotiate deals, you know, how to become an investor, all sorts of different stuff, rebusuniversity.com. And if you want to chat with me, go find me on Instagram. And if you come find me on Instagram, you can send me messages. Tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. We try to put a bunch of content out there too. You can find me in two different places. It's at rerockstars.com for our Real Estate Rockstars page or at erinamuchastegui.com for my personal Instagram page where I can chat with you about all sorts of different things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.